I invite you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Let your mind wander to a time you felt your strongest, your most resilient. Might have been earlier this week, maybe a few months ago. Could have been back in the 90s. Think of a time when you felt most alive, most confident, competent, and good. It might be a time when you were playing a sport and were running with a bounce in your stride. Or maybe you won the spelling bee in primary school. Or a time when you bounced back from a setback or an illness stronger than ever before. Remember that feeling. Feel how it excites your heart, inspires your mind, and wakes up your body. Now open your eyes. How much of our life is spent feeling this way? Sometimes things happen that we don't expect, like this summer as I finished up my PhD and I got shingles. Things happen. I certainly didn't expect to get shingles at 29 years old, and I certainly wasn't feeling resilient when it happened. And yet, I'm incredibly passionate about resilience, from the emotional to the physical, the psychological down to the cellular level and the ways in which we choose resilience, build resilience, and even engineer resilience. My interest in resilience began before I knew the word itself. I was just seven years old, and my older sister, Lily, had just turned 11. We were young and full of energy and life at our most resilient, and yet suddenly, a week later, my sister, Lily, was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. Now, at the time, we slept in adjoining bedrooms separated by a glass door. And we would often stay up late into the night giggling and talking. But after her diagnosis, all of that changed. And that door became a window into the type of life that I had previously never conceived of. I remember waking up each night at 3 in the morning to light filtering in through those windows and looking over to see my dad sitting patiently at her bedside, cajoling her to test her blood sugar to make sure that, she, that her body wasn't overloaded or depleted of the essential blood sugars necessary for her survival. Those first few months were especially difficult, as she got adjusted to a life full of needles and managing her diet, wondering how her body might react on any given day, and whether she could go to soccer practice or might have to stay home from school. I remember looking through those windows and seeing her up, slumped over in exhaustion, eyes red and puffy, and my dad sitting patiently, asking her to prick her finger yet again. And I especially remember the few terrifying nights that she crashed, and her blood sugar levels, her blood sugar levels dropped dangerously low, and she passed out, prompting my dad to furiously rub glucose into her gums, waiting for her to revive. And when she did, how she revived and was upset and confused and crying. Needless to say, my education from the other side of that window was one of the most profound and moving of my life. All of us have likely experienced some sort of challenge to our resilience. It happens to all of us eventually. And yet for my sister, it happened at a very young age. As I grew older, my passion for science flourished. And my interest in studying disease and therapeutic strategies took flight. I wanted to know how do we protect people when their own bodies attack? How do we continue to feel physically resilient when our biology has other plans? Now, you wouldn't think that this relates to yogurt, but it does. In the early 2000s, scientists at a yogurt company were studying a bacteria called Streptococcus thermophilus, a workhorse of the yogurt and cheese industry. They were interested in studying how bacteria fight viral infections. Now, bacteria encounter viruses in their environment, and when they do, it's only a matter of minutes before they're either destroyed or they mount some sort of response to attack that viral infection before it takes over. Building on the foundational work of lots of other research labs, these scientists discovered that their favorite bacteria had an adaptive immunity, which we called CRISPR, that allowed them to seek out and destroy viral DNA. It allowed them to be resilient in the face of viral infection. 
Now, there are many types of bacteria that have this CRISPR system, which functions essentially as an adaptive immune system. Immune, of course, referring to the ability to seek out, target, and destroy foreign invaders like viruses. And adaptive, meaning that they can adapt or change based on their exposure. And part of this CRISPR system is a protein molecule called Cas9 that's able to seek out and target any viral DNA and cleave it. It destroys it, leading to its degradation and preventing the ability of that virus to survive. Without getting too deep into the nitty gritty, essentially this is a natural system that works by naturally targeting a specific sequence of DNA. Now you might remember DNA is what's housed in all of our cells. It comprises our genome. And it's the string of nucleotide units, or letters, that dictate the function of any given gene. We call this the sequence. And with the, the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9, we realized that we had this natural way of finding any particular sequence and targeting it. It could be in any strand of DNA or even in the whole genome. Researchers studying that Cas9 protein recognized its function as a gene editing technology and realized that we then had the capacity to use it as researchers to snip or delete little bits of DNA with incredible precision. The development of CRISPR-Cas9 as a gene editing technology allows us opportunities to do things that just haven't been possible in the past. Now, it's important to note, this isn't the first time we've been able to use gene editing technologies. And while there have been other methods available, none of them have been so easy and so efficient as CRISPR. It's like the Model T Ford. It's far from the first automobile, but its simplicity of production, its dependability and its affordability will transform our society, already is transforming our society. Already we are using CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer the genomes of a multitude of organisms, including humans. We have used CRISPR-Cas9 to change the genes in non-viable human embryos from in vitro fertilization. We have clinical trials underway where we're using CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer cells, patient cells, that then can go in and target specific cancers in their body, in patients, both in the US and China. So why does this matter? Well, there are roughly 6,000 diseases that are caused by genetic mutations. Only about 5% of these have an improved therapy. And the problem is, we have a huge number of mutations in our genome but we don't actually know what each of these does. We don't know whether they're functionally relevant in a disease. But the power of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, it allows us to target each of these one by one and give us the ability to learn the function of each of them, to determine whether they're relevant in disease, to determine whether we might be able to engineer something as a therapeutic around that mutation. And it's the ease of CRISPR that has enabled hundreds, if not thousands, of labs all over the world to tackle this task and to furiously work towards understanding biology at an unprecedented pace. Now, when we think about the diseases that impact us the most, that have the greatest cost to our humanity, to our economy, we often think of diseases that we get as we age. How many people here know somebody who suffered from cancer? or Alzheimer's, diabetes. These are the diseases that we try to prevent by eating well, by exercising, by engaging in a healthy lifestyle. And yet the aging of our cells and our bodies will always catch up. This happens to all of us eventually. Sometimes this happens earlier, sometimes this happens later, but it certainly happens to us all. My passion was seeded by my sister Lily's condition, but it expanded as I began to understand the myriad of ways that biology can compromise our physical resilience. My sister Lily was only 11 years old when she collapsed from her cellular resilience being challenged. She became incredibly vulnerable at a time that we normally associate with the utmost resilience. And it's this vulnerability that we only expect to experience when we're much older. But that kind of loss of resilience, that happens to all of us eventually, to all of our cells as we age. And as we succumb to aging and the often complicated health matters that pair with it, it makes us think, maybe, maybe aging 
is a disease in and of itself. And it begs the question, is this just an engineering problem? Gene editing provides an opportunity to not only cure genetic disease, but also to prevent diseases from ever coming to being, to treat our susceptibilities before they ever transform into symptoms. We can engineer our cells to be resilient in the face of age-related related diseases, and I believe that we can engineer resilience to aging itself. And as we move into this future, it'll be interesting to see how this technology coalesces with others. Might we open up our phones to go on the App Store and have all these various apps hawking us ways to hack our own biology, to change our health or improve our health or change some other sort of trait? What will this look like? And as gene editing therapeutics become more commonplace, I can imagine a day where we go in for our childhood checkups and receive staged gene therapy treatments that prevent diseases before they ever come into being, before they ever manifest as symptomatic. Maybe we could have identified that my sister Lily was susceptible to post-viral autoimmunity, and we could have saved her from a lot of stress and a lot of heartache. Now I'd like to ask you to pause and consider. If you could choose to change a trait, would you? What if it were a disease like diabetes? What if it were to enhance an ability like athleticism or intellectual prowess? Maybe you've always wanted to slam dunk a basketball, but you just don't have the hops. Or it could be purely aesthetic. Might you change your genome the same way some of us take vitamins or eat vegan practice yoga? Will you feel empowered to manipulate your own biology to choose the lifestyle that you want? Will you even want to engineer your way out of aging? Does a longer life mean a better life? And do you want to engineer your own resilience? We have the ability to push the limits of the human potential. The question is, will you? And as with any technology, there are those who will opt in and those who will opt out. And as gene therapy becomes more commonplace and we move beyond traits of health into other types, there will certainly be people who choose not to participate. So what will it mean for us as humans as some of us begin to engineer our way into a new species? However we move forward, it is critical that our visions for technology, for design and for creativity are married with compassion and with humanity. We have started by tackling diseases, by trying to improve our health. And in doing so, we are likely also increasing our lifespan. And if we're able to engineer our longevity and to extend the processes of aging to later in life, what does that mean for the way that we live? What does that mean for the way that we relate to one another, to our offspring, to our great, great, great grandchildren that we might one day meet? If we are to change the nature of aging, are we also changing the nature of life? Thank you.